Thank you everybody for joining us today for our first virtual Spinouts community event. Sal and I from the Center for Research Innovation are happy to have you. My name is Katie Hemphill and I'm Director of Tech Ventures and Talent Network at Northeastern's Center for Research Innovation. At the Center for Research Innovation, we help protect intellectual property coming out of Northeastern, determine the most appropriate path to commercialize. And if that path happens to be spinning out a new company, that's where Sal and I come in to assist. So that's what we do in a nutshell. Again, thank you to everybody who's joined us today. We're, we're very, very happy to have you. Today's discussion is gonna focus on two sessions um, based on videos that we asked you to watch as kind of a read ahead or a watch ahead this go round. The first is really focused on key factors for successful spin-outs. And the key takeaway from that video was timing, which we'll talk with our expert panelists about shortly. And then we'll do a deep dive into the difference between incubators and accelerators, which help our very early stage spin-outs get from point A to point B and help them think through that market validation, as well as that go-to-market strategy. After we complete our uh, discussion sessions, we'll move over to audience Q&A. We do ask that as the discussion is ongoing, you put your questions real time into the chat so that you don't forget them. After the discussion portion, the facilitated discussion portion here, I will keep those questions in mind and I will help facilitate um, the audience Q&A at the end of this uh, di facilitated discussion session. Then we'll have brief closing statements. And from there, um, we hope you'll join us for a future event based on your experience today. With that, Sal, I think we can head to the next slide. Now I'm going to invite our panelists to introduce themselves, beginning with um, Marita McGinn. Hello, really happy to be with you all this afternoon. I'm Marita. Uh, I'm based in Salem, Mass, and I am the director of the Mass Robotics Accelerator. So for those who are not familiar with Mass Robotics, it is one of the, the world's largest independent nonprofits that works with robotics companies. So our mission is to advance robotics technologies, and we have a technical co-working space is kind of how I like to describe it in the seaport of Boston. We have a full prototyping lab, really anything a roboticist would need to build a startup. Um, about 85 different companies working at Mass Robotics right now. And uh, the next kind of stage of our mission is launching the accelerator. So that's what I'm doing. I'm building a um, very special equity-free startup accelerator for robotics companies. And we are giving each company who participates $100,000 in non dilutive capital in addition to a lot of robust business training and um, yeah, basically the learning the in, in, ins and outs of running a robotics company. Awesome, thanks so much, Marita. Uh, Nate, would you like to go next? Yes, hello everybody. Hi, I'm Nate Ani, uh, nice to meet you all. Um, it's great to, uh, to have this conversation today. Um, so a little bit about myself, um, for as long as I can remember, I've wanted to do my own business. And I think I was destined to be an entrepreneur at an early age because I always had ideas for companies that I wanted to start. Um, and I guess I have that genetic defect as Dharma Shah, uh, the co-founder of HubSpot calls it, um, because I start companies despite the poor odds of success. And a little bit about my background, I studied computer science out on the West Coast. Um, I spent several years abroad in Denmark and how I ended up in Boston was that I came here to study music at Berkeley College of Music. And I had a few jobs before starting my own company, including working at a couple startups. So I sort of had a taste of what it would be like, um, but those experiences I think were all just preparation for starting my own company, which I did in 1999. Uh, that was a web consulting firm. Uh, we built websites, web applications, uh, mostly for nonprofits. And I did that for about 10 years and then I gradually got tired of the hamster wheel of jumping from one consulting project to another. And I got the itch to do a real startup um, building a product company, uh, which ended up being a B2B SaaS software company in the tech ed space. So education um, for teaching technical, um, technical training, technical concepts. And how I got started with that was on a whim, I pitched an idea at a startup weekend. I was actually at the, the Microsoft Nerd Center if, anyone's familiar with that. Um, and we came in second place. And so that was exciting. Um, and then decided to actually start a company around it. And the original team 
kind of the people who were with me on the weekend kind of all went their separate ways. Um, so I recruited a friend to join me as a co-founder. And then after about a year, we weren't making very much money. So he left and I considered shutting down the company at that point. Um, but I did a Hail Mary um, and got into uh, the Mass Challenge program, which I think we're going to talk more about later. Um, and then I would go on to build a team of around 30 employees. We attracted around 50 customers um, and I basically bootstrapped it for nine years. I took on a little bit of debt financing, uh, raised a small round of financing um, very late in our journey, like at the end of um, at the end of the 11 year journey, I raised some money and then I sold the company in November. Uh, I felt very fortunate to have a positive outcome since most startups, uh, as you all know, don't make it. Uh, much less have a successful exit. Um, so I've been taking a year a sabbatical to recover. It's very mentally exhausting um, to be a solo founder for that long period of time. And, and now I'm advising other early stage companies uh, while I'm trying to figure out my next move. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nate and Marita, for your introductions. With that, I think, Sal, we're going to head into our facilitated discussion period. Yes, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so the first video uh, to watch was uh, the key factors for successful spinouts. Um, you know, I I had a, a one uh, key takeaway that was surprising to me. Something that I found surprising was um, uh, the effect of timing. Uh, but on in retrospect, thinking through it, uh, you know, there's countless examples of timing and the importance of timing to market that come to mind. Uh, the one uh, uh, that um, came immediately to mind was uh, pets.com and how they failed, which is a big, you know, uh, flame out. Uh, and of course, you know, many years later now, we've got Chewy, which is a very highly successful company, which is essentially identical um, to the pets.com minus the sock puppet. Um, so um, that, that was a, a, an interesting takeaway that I had. Um, I'm going to ask some questions of the uh uh, of Marita and Nate now, and um, uh, interested to hear their responses. Uh, Marita, um, you have extensive experience from SVB and uh, Techstars, Indiegogo. Uh, what are some of the factors uh, that you have seen that are uh, that lead to successful startups? And could you talk a little bit about uh, what you've seen from your experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um... Great choices, by the way, for the, the pre-reading slash watching. I I loved the, the TEDx speaker. I thought that was really interesting. And oftentimes I think that team is the most important. So I had my kind of perspective challenged a little bit in that video. I really appreciated it. Um, with that being said, I, I do think team, especially in the very early days, is probably one of the most important things. Um, you know, like the, the matching between co-founders is actually a huge important thing. And Nate, I'm curious to hear your perspective on team, especially as a solo founder. I think sometimes solo founders, like there's this negative connotation of like building a company as a sole founder. But if you don't find someone or have something that you are connected with another person in order to build a long-term relationship, like, a, you know, it sounds like Nate, your business was 11 years. Um, that's a really long period of time to be working with someone. So I think it's absolutely essential for early stage startups to find someone that they can build a very strong and trusting relationship with and also have a relationship that is, you know, you have clear swimming lanes, like kind of people have their own roles and responsibilities, but they can be kind of nimble with that and you can lend in. Um, I work with a lot of technical founders and oftentimes, you know, a technical founder might want to become the CEO of a startup, but they stay a little bit too close to the tech. And it's important to kind of have very clear swimming lanes of what you're looking to accomplish. Um, yeah, but, but I mean, really idea changes all the time, right? Especially when we're talking about incubators and accelerators, I think idea is far less important then, you know, team and then also just traction. Like what have you been able to accomplish in your time of, um, you know, building with your, with your co-founder or with your founding team? 
Yeah, uh, great points, Marita. Um, Nate, I, I'd like to uh, extend uh, and ask uh, Marita's question to you. Um, could you talk a little bit about your experience and your uh, and your team in those eleven years uh, during your startup? And uh, also, um, if you don't mind, uh, you know, knowing that uh, you're a semi-technical or technical founder, like how did you interact and split up the technical role with your team? Uh, you might be on oh, mute. Nate, I think, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I I am a technical founder, um, which means I um, was always tempted to focus too much on the product and the engineering because that's what felt comfortable. That's what felt natural to me, and under indexed the the critical sales and marketing piece. Um, fortunately, our company. Um, because we sort of piggybacked on another popular open source product, um, a lot of the marketing was kind of done for us, I guess, for, for lack of um, for, for lack of better explanation, we we just had a lot of people reaching out to us by virtue of being kind of joined at the hip associated with this this popular open source project. So um, I was able to kind of get away with lackadaisical marketing in the early days, but that didn't last. And eventually we did have to invest in, you know, sales and marketing team. But I, I would say that is a, a caveat. If you are a technical founder, it's really important to find a counterpart, find someone who has more of a, a sales or marketing background who can, can really, you know, like, um, like Marita said, like, like have stay in that swim lane um, and be really clear on who's doing what. I did eventually um, hire, not exactly a co-founder, but I hired a VP of engineering who became probably the, the closest thing to a co-founder. He joined in 2016 um, and stayed with the company until we exited last year. So we were really, um, I took on more of the CEO, CEO role, even though I had a technical background and he was kind of playing more of the CIO, CTO role. So it took a little while for us to adapt and figure out who is doing what, because we would often kind of, I would sort of cross over into his domain and, and vice versa. But eventually we um, we figured out and, and made it very explicit, very clear, like who is doing what. So that's that's really important if you want to move fast, you have to make sure that you're aligned on, you know, roles and responsibilities. Yeah, excellent, excellent answer. Um, <clears throat> Marita, I, a question for you. Um, you know, speaking from your experience, uh, can you share uh, an instance in your career where you're that, like there's you saw an effect of uh, timing and entering the market where it made a significant uh, in impact in the trajectory of the startup? I would love to. I, I thought a lot about this question actually for a couple of days now, and I wanted to come up with a, uh, an answer or uh, from just the Boston area, but I'm going to share a company that maybe a lot of you haven't heard of. It's called GIA. It's G-H-I-A. And they are one of my favorite consumer packaged goods companies. While I love working with technical founders, I just like, I could get lost at Whole Foods. Like I love to walk the halls of cool grocery stores that I shouldn't be spending so much time in. Um, and GIA is a non-alcoholic aperitif. Um, so they launched the summer of 2020. I, I also worked at Silicon Valley Bank and they were a part of our portfolio. So that's how I got to know them. Um, and yeah, it was the first summer post COVID or not post COVID first summer of COVID. Um, we were all kind of confused what we were doing and I don't know about any of you, but I think a, a lot of people realized like, Hey, maybe I'm drinking too much. So for me, I, I stopped drinking the summer of 2020 and Gia was one of those products that kind of opened my eyes to a lot of different types of innovations in CPG. And the founder launched the perfect time. Like they were really the first to market. Um, they've now been tons of followers in the non-alcoholic space. It's actually like super, super busy. Um, but they were the ones that kind of got investors to take this category really seriously and show that it has a, a real need. And, you know, like now you go to a restaurant and you see a, an entire menu of non-alcoholic beverages. So I, I just think that's a really cool story of them taking something that was really not a part of our society. And now they're one of like the 
kind of founding members of the non-alcoholic space. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so, Nate, um, would you mind talking a little bit about um, timing as well? Um, I know that you went the long run uh, in 11 years. Um, was there an impact of timing on, on your um, venture? Well, certainly when we when we launched our product um, in, I think it was like 2015, 2016 timeframe, um, we were kind of in the right place at the right time. The market was really looking for an easier to use platform to build online courses. And we took this very popular open source product, which was very challenging to, to download and install yourself. And we made it sort of point and click easy. And so I think that really appealed to a lot of the people that were interested in the product, but didn't have the technical chops to, to get it running themselves. And, and so we offered that as a, as a SaaS product. So I think we were in the right place at the right time. Um, there was a lot of interest when we, when we released that. Um, but I've seen it go the other way too, where, you know, you're either too early and there's not enough demand. People don't even, they, they can't even identify with the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, or you're too late and the market's already very saturated, it's very mature, and you're trying to be like a me too, a me too product. So I think timing does really play a, a key role. You don't want to be too far ahead and, and trying to launch, um, like try to try to create a new product category is really challenging unless you have a lot of funding and you have really good marketing people. Um, it's much easier to kind of enter an existing market where you can kind of be a wedge and you can offer something um, that's differentiated from the other, you know, existing players in the space. Fantastic. Uh, and since we're talking about timing, I think this is a, um, a good place for us to maybe switch over to our second uh, topic. Um, you know, I, I, we're going to monitor the uh, chat for questions and there's definitely some time built in for for more in-depth Q&A. So we can always uh, circle back to this topic if needed. But uh, the second uh, you know, topic, which is more of a deep dive, was really about incubators and accelerators and what the difference is. And that was, that was the video. Um, <clears throat> this is an important topic for spinouts at Northeastern. Um, many of them uh, receive grant funding and uh, are built in labs. But when they leave Northeastern, they tend to go to incubators and accelerators. And for uh, many of our audience, this is an important topic, understanding the, the differences. And, they, and many of our founders consider um, you know, what path is right for them. And so i um, really fortunate to have both of you on the call today with your deep experience with incubators and accelerators. Um, my first question, um, Nate, is going to go to you. Um, you know, you uh, um, had, spoke a little bit about your initial, your experience at uh, Mass Challenge uh, in uh, 2010. Uh, based on your experience, um, how would you differentiate the support and value provided by accelerator, accelerators like Mass Challenge from that of incubators? And what specific opportunities or mentorship opportunities uh, um, stood out to you from your experience? Yeah, so first I'll say that um, I'm somewhat of an accelerator junkie, uh, as Sal knows well. Um, I did Mass Challenge uh, twice. I was in the inaugural class. And then I came back the next year and did it again um, with pretty much the same company. But uh, at that point, we had changed our name and had a completely different business focus. Um, I also did tech, tech stars. I did some, some lesser known accelerators, Thai Boston and Mozilla Web Forward. Um, so I have a lot of experience doing a number of different accelerators. I also participated in the Dogpatch Labs incubator in Kendall Square. Uh, which was a really sweet deal because we basically had office space, uh, free office space that was sort of subsidized by Dogpatch um, or by um, Polaris Ventures was the, the VC firm that was offering that. Um, and so my experience with the incubator was that it provided office space, which was really key, um, and a community of other startups. So there were a lot of other companies working in that space and you can network with other founders. Um, there were a lot of social events to, to connect with other people. Um, and that's sort of where the incubator stopped. There wasn't really a lot of additional value add besides the office space and the community. Um, my experience with Mass Challenge and Techstars um, 
is they not only provided the office space and the community, but they also provided mentors, like really experienced experts. You know, a lot of a lot of these folks were founders themselves, um, and they would very regularly invite experts to come into the Mass Challenge space and present to all the startups. And it was an opportunity to ask questions and and really learn from from people who had experience in different areas that that you don't have experience in, right? They'd bring in legal experts and they would bring in marketing people. And, you know, as a founder, you, you just can't do everything. You have to find people who have expertise in areas that you're not familiar with. And then obviously both Mass Challenge and Techstars had an opportunity at the end of the program to, to pitch, right? To do like a demo day pitch. Um, and in the case of Mass Challenge, they provided like a grant, a non-dilutive uh, grant. And with Techstars, um, the, the demo day pitch is basically an opportunity to get external, like outside funding from, from investors. Well, you, you mentioned um, that you uh, changed the name uh, of the company. Mm -hmm. And could you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, just because a lot of the spin outs that we have, you know, uh, may, may change not names, but, um, you know, often pivot uh, quite extensively trying to find their product market fit. So I'm curious to hear if there was any, uh, like what motivated it and, and, you know, and some of the background around the name change. Yeah, it was, it was more than just a name change. We, we actually deprecated the original product that we built because um, some really large players entered the space and we, we realized that it was like a race to zero. Um, and so, so we, um, we retained kind of the, the original idea, but we pivoted to, um, to building something quite different from the original idea. Um, and that probably would have been an opportunity to just shut down the original business and then like start a new one, um, with a new name and, you know, like a new, a new C corp or, or an LLC. Um, but I was lazy and I just, I had the company already running and had done all the paperwork. So I'm just like, I'm just going to keep it going. Um, that if we have time, I can talk about some of the, the downsides of doing that. Cause then later, um, you know, that, that had an effect on, you know, when I, when I finally exited, there was a lot of, um, stakeholders that were on the original, um, cap table from when I founded the company who didn't really have anything to do with this kind of second phase of the company. So in, in retrospect, it probably would, would have been better for me to just like shut down the original idea and then do a, re, a restart. Um, but I don't know if you wanted me to talk about the competitive space or the, like the naming, like renaming the company that wasn't too difficult because we yeah. didn't really have you know, no, that so that that um that, thanks for elaborating. The I think that's uh the answer that we're looking for and the level of detail we're looking for. I guess um yeah. you know my my follow up question there is that did you get help uh, from uh, Mass Challenge or like were your mentors involved with that decision and like you know what what sort of support uh, did you have at the time? Yeah, I think, you know, for, for me, we, we decided to enter a much less competitive space. And, you know, we did talk with our mentors at Math Challenge and, and Techstars, and they were all in agreement that, you know, it, it made sense. There were only three or five other companies that we were directly competing with in the, the new space that we moved into. Um, and, and in the early days, it was more like we were co-competitors. There was so much demand for what we were doing that there were plenty of customers for us to win. Um, and in a growing market, you can have multiple companies that can all be successful because there's so much demand and, and each company can kind of cater to different segments. You might have some that are going after SMB, others mid-market, other enterprise, or maybe different verticals. You know, some might go after K-12, other, you know, other companies in the space might go after, um, you know, more of like the commercial space. Right. So I think for, for us, it was kind of an obvious decision. Like it, we didn't really have to debate it very much. It was, it was kind of like a natural transition. Right. Yeah. It sounds like you have some, um, like lessons learned around, uh, cap tables and some of the complexity when it comes to the, the eventual sale, but, um, it, you know, it, it does sound like it worked out for you long-term. Um, my, um, next question is, uh, going to be for Marita. Um, <clears throat> so, 
Yeah, you're um, working at Mass Robotics now. Could you talk us through a real life example of um, the intake process at Mass Robotics and what does it take? I, I feel that um, that is going is a value to the spin outs community uh, and especially understanding like, what it takes to be um, accepted into a program like Mass Robotics. Love it. So I'll, I'll just preface this by saying I'm building the accelerator right now. So I don't have, I haven't been through a cohort yet. Um, our applications are open right now. So they close on November 30th. Um, if anyone is building a robotics, uh, you know, focused company, whether it's uh, hardware or, or an application, um, I'm totally happy to talk about it offline and, and encourage you to apply. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we're thinking for our application process at Mass Robotics, but I'll also talk a little bit about <coughs> my experience at Techstars. So I worked at Techstars for a couple of years. I managed two corporate programs, one for the Air Force and one for Barclays. And Techstars is extremely competitive. Um, I had like several hundred, I think even close to a thousand applications for the Barclays program. Um, and their application process is extremely robust. Um, I'm scaling mine back a bit because I don't think I'm gonna have a thousand applications to read through. Um, but for Mass Robotics, we have initial interviews um, the first week in December. So uh, we, we're thinking probably our top 40 companies and having one-on-one -on -one interviews with those, with those founders. So it'll be myself and then um, Tom Ryden, who's our executive director at Mass Robotics. He has a technical background. He's a uh, roboticist and entrepreneur. Um, we're looking to narrow our applicant pool to our top 20. And those people, those founders are going to be pitching to a selection committee. So the, the committee is comprised of robotics entrepreneurs, uh, VCs, um, university representatives, and, and people from the state of Massachusetts. And really what we're looking for in this process is kind of what we talked about a little earlier, understanding uh, the demonstration of why this team is so excellent at what they're doing. Like why are they the right team to be working on the, the problem that they're really addressing? And then two, like what is the traction that the team has accomplished thus far? So one of our application questions is, um, what's your MRR, your monthly recurring revenue? Um, and the options are, I think it goes like at my startup is pre-revenue all the way up to $50,000 a month. And for the companies that are pre-revenue, we want to know like, what engagements do you have with your customers, your potential customers? Are you actively seeking customer discovery interviews, which is a big part of our actual, our curriculum at Mass Robotics. Um, idea, again, way less important than uh, team market timing and traction because it's probable that your idea will change during an accelerator. You see that a lot. And especially with technical founders, one of my favorite sayings is um, kill your darlings. Like it's okay to kill one of your ideas. That's kind of your baby, but maybe it doesn't have the right market viability after you do all your customer discovery interviews. So yeah, mass robotics, way less competitive because we're just getting started. But Techstars, um, if anyone's interested, by the way, in, like, in going after one of those really big accelerators, or maybe this is applicable to everyone, I think showing extreme enthusiasm gets you a lot. So finding out who the decision makers are that you'll be interviewing with, you know, send them an email, reach out to them on LinkedIn preemptively, like really show a lot of initiative and um, show enthusiasm for your startup, because I think that goes a long way. Um, in these early discussions. Wow, that's a, a great advice. Um, I mean, I, <clears throat> it's fantastic. Um, Nate, uh, from what Marita said, um, does that kind of match your opinion and experience um, you, as a self-described, um, you know, accelerator and incubator junkie? Like, you know, what what did you do to gain acceptance into the programs that you were part of? Yeah, well, I, I agree with Marita that uh, networking is really key. So I got introduced um, to the directors of the Techstars Boston program through some friends of mine um, who had worked with, with them before. 
and I reached out to them and they said, Hey, we've got this, um, this new accelerator, um, called Techstars cloud. And we think you'd be a really good fit for that. So I got an intro to Jason seats, um, who was the, the co-founder of slice host that got acquired by Rackspace. Um, and so he was just launching the Techstars cloud program in San Antonio, Texas. And, and I applied for that um, as a solo founder. And Jason um, said, hey, I'm going to be in New York. Can you, can you meet me um, next week? And so I, I took the Chinatown bus down to New York City. I met him at a, a cafe near the bus station. We met for about an hour. And then I got back on the bus, came back to Boston. Um, and I, did, I didn't know after that, that hour-long meeting if... I was going to get in and then he called me a couple of weeks later, like right around Thanksgiving and, and said that, um, that I was accepted into the program, um, with one caveat that he, he wanted me to, to find a co-founder. So entering the program, that was like my MO for the first month or so was trying to find a co-founder and was, was not successful. Actually, it was, it was quite distracting to try to do that at the same time I was trying to meet with all the mentors, um, and, and try to get, as Marita said, try to get traction in those first three months. So yeah, it was, it was a very um, challenging time because you're trying to prepare for demo day, you're trying to get your product built, you're trying to do customer discovery. It's very intense. I will say that I experienced something that they call mentor whiplash. Um, and in the first month you meet with probably a dozen different mentors. And often you get conflicting advice. You tell them about your business, your idea, and one person would say one thing, another person would say another thing, and you're just like, wait, what? Is, isn't everyone supposed to be agreeing here? Um, and you realize very quickly that um, everyone has an opinion, and you have to kind of stay, you know, stay true to your North Star and you know, what, it, what it is you're trying to do with your company, lest you get kind of sidetracked and thrown off course. Um, so I think if I had one piece of advice, it's, it's don't try to be everything to everybody. Um, I think that's a death sentence for a startup. You, just, you simply don't have the resources to make a great product for everyone. You have to make a product for a great product for a particular niche. And then once you've established a beachhead, then and only then do you consider expanding to serve other kinds of customers. Um, and so one of the exercises we did, and this was something that was recommended to me by some of our mentors, was to define an ICP, which is a ideal customer profile. And once you've really narrowed that down after doing your customer interviews, then everything becomes easier. Your marketing, your sales, your product, your fundraising, all those become a lot easier once you figure out like what you're building and, and whom you're building it for. Um, so that, that was a, a hard lesson to learn because I naively wanted to build a product that was like universally uh, appealed universally to lots of different segments and a lot of different types of industries. Um, and that just doesn't work, um, especially in the early days. Excellent. Yeah. Th th thank you. Um, <clears throat> so Marie, I'm going to go back to you uh, with a question. Um, you worked uh, for a while at, at SVB. Um, and so, um, you know what? You know, an SVB uh, financial institution, um, you know, offers mentorship and advice to startups as well. How does that startup and advice differ from the types of uh, um, start uh, advice that you might get from a, uh, an incubator or an accelerator? Yeah. So, just as a one quick note to Nate's mentor backlash, it's. It's kind of funny. So when I did the, the, the Air Force program, we had companies meet with 80 mentors in a period of two weeks. And it was like extreme chaos. It was crazy. And they do that on purpose. Like they want the founders to have mentor whiplash. So then people are sort of like forced to have to make their own decisions instead of just, you know, taking what your mentors have to say. It's I'm making I'm doing a little bit of a different approach uh, for mass robotics. But back to SVB and so I, I view it's the job of the person who's running the startup accelerator or incubator to really surround the startups with resources that they need. So you have to have a bank and there's a bunch out there and it's kind of, I view it as my job to kind of coach founders into figuring out what makes sense for them. Um, I didn't mention this in the beginning and maybe you've already gathered this, but I don't have a background in robotics, but I'm leading a robotics accelerator. 
And that's because I have all these wonderful connections and people around me in the Boston area and just my startup community that I can pick people in and make sure that I'm building a curriculum that's full of very experienced people who really know their stuff. Um, so I, I think it's, it's really, you know, you bring your service providers like your CRM solutions or cloud providers, lawyers, bankers, they all have a very important role for early stage startups. I mean, I think the thing that they should all have in common is that they have a um, just a true interest in, in wanting to support early stage companies. Um, specifically on the banking side, by the way, I would really recommend all of you, because you all probably will have a bank for your startup, um, really lean on your banker for help with fundraising. I think this is something that's often kind of like you don't think to ask your banker for help. But at least at Silicon Valley Bank, we banked early stage companies, but we also banked the majority of VCs. I don't know what that landscape sort of looks like now with the fall of SVB, but just know like they all want your business and they really want to help you. So ask a lot of your bankers. I think that's kind of an important thing to kind of think through. Um, yeah, I mean, I would also just like find the people who, again, are most enthusiastic and look really helpful. Like I'll give one example. So one of my former colleagues, her name is Sharita. Uh, she's at SVB. She's an early stage banker. I see her on LinkedIn every single week with an incredible event that she's doing for early stage companies. Like she's just on fire. She is the only person out of six people on my team who remained at SVB. And she's just like really kicking butt and you can tell she really cares. So like I would absolutely recommend anyone work with someone like that because she clearly cares. So I think you kind of just have to sniff out the people who are, who care versus, you know, are just trying to get your business to fill their quota. Yeah, that's a uh, fan, like, again, great, great advice. And you, and you made a call back to um, the, the value of like the network and networking. Um, and I'm just going to throw this out there that when we were putting together this panel, uh, we approached you and Nate separately, but you actually had worked together in the past, uh, uh, you know, in this type of relationship and that it is a small world. Like people do, uh, it's a small community, especially with startups and in the Boston area. So, um, specifically you know, in Boston. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like Boston's a tiny city but it, and that's actually why I like it like I lived in New York for a while and I, there was all these like different startup communities but there was no like startup community um and that's why I love being back in Boston like it's it's just wonderful like it's actually really cool so Nate and I met through SVB but it's I I also worked at Techstars and he was a part of Techstars and Mass Challenge like there's just so much overlap between individuals in Boston which I think is really special yeah, fantastic. Um, you you started uh, talking a little bit about um, um, mass robotics and um your approach, especially when it comes to um, um a mentor whiplash. Could you could you elaborate on that? Because I feel like um we'd love to hear your you know how how you plan on. Yeah, totally. So my goal overall uh, is to help technical founders realize that they can be very successful business people. So helping technical people become really strong CEOs. Um, when I was at Techstars, I, the programming is amazing. The mentorship is amazing. Like the or, overall, their programs, I think, are very well run. Um, but it's like extreme boot camp style, um, like truly extreme. Like you work all the time. And I just didn't feel like the founders had enough time to actually do all of the work that they needed to gain some traction during those three months. So I'm scaling my program back a little bit. Um, I'm cutting some of the, the programming that I felt was, wasn't was super relevant or um, basically I just wanna make sure our founders have enough time to do the things that we ask them of. So it's three months long. Um, each month has a little bit of a different cadence. So the first month is all about listening and learning. So I do want a little bit of that whiplash, but not too much. So I think our founders are gonna be meeting with anywhere between 25 and 50 mentors over the first couple of weeks. Um, they'll then go on to choose their kind of like advisory board of mentors. So these are people that are gonna be meeting with the founders every week throughout the program. 
Um, the second month is all about customer discovery, especially with highly technical founders. Like if you just walk through the halls with math robotics, they're all, you know, roboticists. Uh, they oftentimes like to just kind of stay in the lab and it's important to go talk to customers. So end users, but then also buyers. So we're having each company do at least 25 customer interviews. And then the last month is all purely about fundraising. Um, fundraising from institutional investors, so VCs, uh, corporate venture capital, but then also about how to take advantage of state and federal resources. So how to work with the state of Massachusetts, but then also like how to actually win an SBIR and all of the different phases of an SBIR. So I'm bringing in several experts who can help on that front. But yeah, it's going to be special. We're, we're culminating at the Robotics Summit and Expo, which is an existing conference at the Convention Center in early May. And all the, all the companies will be able to pitch to investors, but then also buyers who are going to be in the, in the crowd. So yeah, Biz, lots of business training, less robotics, because I don't need to teach a PhD about robotics yeah. because they already know that. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you. I think that gives a really good peek, uh, you know, uh, at what it will be like to be part of uh, a program like that. And um, yeah, thank you so much. We're going to head to Q&A here. Um, so I'm going to pass it to Katie. Uh, are there any questions either from the chat or uh, any questions that rolled in? Thanks, Sal. And thanks, Maria and Nate. Great discussion so far. We do have one question in the chat, and I want to encourage folks, again, to post your questions in the chat and or raise your hands at this point. We're, we're headed into kind of open Q&A, so we're happy to hear from you directly if you want to ask your question directly uh, to Nate or Marita. So the question that came in was, was around, we like tangible takeaways. This crowd likes tangible takeaways. And so we have some folks who are potentially interested in seeking, um, applying for something like Mass Challenge or something like Techstars, and would like to hear more about that application and selection process to the best of your ability, Nate, you know, from you as an applicant, Marita, from you as, as a past reviewer and or kind of behind the scenes operator of some of this. And uh, the next question will be probably to you, Nate, though, Marita, we're happy to have your perspective as well. After participating in the program, what was kind of the key takeaway or um, golden outcome, right, for you as an early stage company beyond the mentorship, beyond, you know, maybe some of the investment connections that were made? What, were there, was there something else that really stuck with you as um, really great about what the program offered that maybe we haven't already covered? So the, fir the first part of the question was, what was the application process like? And then the second part is, after the program is over, what were the takeaways or exactly. benefits? Okay. Um, so first I'll say it's been over 10 years since I've applied, actually 11 years since I've applied for either program. So um, my my memory might be a little bit fuzzy and they may have, they may have changed the application process, but I am... Um, advising a early stage company right now, and they're considering applying for Techstars. So I've been doing a little bit of research into, you know, how the application process has changed. Um, what do they need to do to set up for success if they hope to get into the program? Um, so I think, uh, I think Marita mentioned this, that networking with the, the program directors and in, in the same way that you wouldn't just uh, apply cold for a job, uh, you try to find a connection to the hiring manager or someone that you know at the company and try to get a warm intro. Um, so is true with Accelerator, right? If you can find someone who is on the staff or ideally the managing director at Techstars or Mass Challenge, um, it helps to to meet with that person before you apply. So they they know who you are, they understand your motivation, they've heard the enthusiasm you have for your company. Um, that can really give you a leg up when you finally do apply. Um, as far as like what they look for in the, the application process, um, obviously team is really important. Marita mentioned this, that, um, you know, uh, a great team will always beat a mediocre team given the same market and the product. Um, startups with great teams will also figure out quickly if they're building the wrong product or if they're in the wrong market. Um, I like, what Mark Andreessen says about this, that in a great market, one with lots of real potential customers, the market's gonna pull the, pull the product out of the startup. Um, and if you have a great market, then you can always like upgrade the team. You can you know, attract other more ex savvy experienced um, talent to your company. 
Um, so I, I'd say when you're when you're applying, you obviously want to emphasize your team um, because that's they're really betting on you and your co-founder um, and anyone else on your team because they know that through the course of the program, the idea is probably going to change, the market might change, like who you're going after, all that stuff can change. Um, so having a team that's you know adaptable, flexible, passionate, um, all that's going to really be really important when you're applying. Awesome. Yeah, I, I may yeah, go just jump in there too. So like, I, I think people should really shop around when they are looking for an accelerator. I think there's a couple of big names like YC and Techstars, and they're very good programs, but they're not the only programs. And there's just a ton of accelerators out there and incubators. And we didn't touch a ton on this, <laughs> but like, I think the differences between an incubator and accelerator are like kind of um, dwindling. Like oftentimes they're pretty similar. So I think it's most important to just find the right program for you and your business's success and kind of like try to put the vanity metrics on the shelf. Um, it's very sexy to go to YC, but it's also really, really hard to get in. Um, and you may find one, especially if you have a very niche product, um, maybe a different program is better. Like if any of you are PhDs, like Activate's program is incredible. They do a two year long fellowship to teach founders really how to do business. And I know Northeastern works closely with them. Um, and then another thing I wanna mention is like finding a program that you are gonna be very comfortable giving some equity away. Um, that was like one of the big distinctions oftentimes between incubators and accelerators. Accelerators often take like six to 8% of your company and that is kind of a lot. It can be kind of expensive. So really thinking through that. Um, but the overall like application process, I think it's more important to like realize that you are also choosing them. Um, they're not just choosing you just like in any job interview. Um, so you have to find a program that you can actually find like a bit of a home and community in. Um, also, like I'm a big believer in in-person accelerator programs. I ran two programs. One was in-person and one was not. And the one that was in-person, they're all still best friends. And they actually, like all these founders lean on one another. Um, they have very strong relationships leaving the program. So I'll just take that into kind of consideration as well. Thanks so much, Marita. So we had another question come in that is kind of related to what are you getting out of some of these experiences when you find the right one, right? And you go to a play and you think it's really the right fit for you and your team, as well as your idea, you know, beyond networking, beyond mentoring, what is it you feel you're receiving, you know, from the accelerator incubator experience that you cannot replicate on your own or through some other experience that may not take equity, for example? Yeah, I, I can take this one. Um, so you can fundraise on your own, right? If, if you have a good network or you're particularly um, persistent, you can uh, reach out to investors and you, know, you can do it on your own. The, I think the advantage of going through an accelerator is that um, you are one of a select group of companies that are sort of pre-vetted, right? They're, they're being presented to a group of investors who've also been vetted by the accelerator program. So there's a there's a sense of like matchmaking that happens where um, your chances of getting fundraising and getting it completed sooner rather than later are much higher um, because the investors know that Techstars has done the due diligence and they've prepared you for funding and you're you're going to be a much more mature a company than someone who maybe hasn't gone through an accelerator and hasn't sort of been groomed so to speak. Um, so the the, the investors are lining up to see what companies are coming out of the accelerators and they're excited and they know they're going to invest in a certain handful of them, right? It's just a question of, are you one of those companies they are going to invest in? Um, so that's, that's one of the big, the big benefits is just fundraising is a lot easier. I think if you've gone through an accelerator, um, the second thing is once you get through the program, um, the network, uh, at least with Techstars, is excellent. So you're, 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 you sort of have lifetime membership 
in a network of a growing body of founders all over the world who you can reach out to as partners or as customers or just advice on any number of topics, right? There's so many people and, and Techstars really has this kind of give give first um, attitude where, you know, anytime you have a problem, you can reach out to another founder and, and they'll they'll bend over backwards to help you out. And I think that goes a long way because running a company is a, can be a very lonely activity. It's very lonely at the top if you're one of the co-founders. So to the extent that you can um, extend your network and have other peers who are going through the same experience, maybe they're like a year or two ahead of you and they've already gone, they're at a different stage of their company and they want to help you get to that stage too. So I think having access to that network, um, there's tons and tons of you know discussion forums and chats and, and events that they organize. Getting plugged into that is just going to help you through your journey. Um, at least it, it really helped me. Marita, anything you want to add to that? And then we have one more question before we'll close out. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with Nate. I'll, I moved back to Boston. I'm from around here, but I moved back to run the Techstars program in 2019. And all of my startup friends are from Techstars. I got the job that I have right now because of Techstars. Like the network aspect is really amazing, especially in cities where like the accelerator has been running for a long time. Um, Techstar, Boston was Techstars' second location from Boulder. So they have a very deep, deep network in the Boston area. And I totally agree. The give first thing is real. Um, and I, I think that's, um, totally able to be replicated in all sorts of different things. I mean, I, that's one of the things I hope for my accelerator is that every year, um, you know, founders come back and, and give back as mentors and, and really have a community. I think the main benefit though of an accelerator is just like the pressure cooker of focus. Like you're in this experience for three months with people who are going through something similar and just the, you just unlock different things when you're doing something like that with a group of people. Great. Thank you. So our last question here, uh, fabulous discussion so far. Our last question here is around timing, back to timing uh, from the start of the conversation, but related to accelerators and incubators here. At what point should or would a company think through potentially applying to an accelerator? We're working with a lot of early stage spinouts here, and so some of them don't feel they're ready yet. Um, but they're interested in at what point do you kind of think through this? Marita, you're off mute, so I'll hand this to you first. Cool. Uh, I, I think like incubators, accelerators, raising money, like it's all part of the life cycle for a startup. So for some of you on this call, like potentially you're leaving Northeastern soon, maybe it's time to go explore a incubator. So like one I really like in Boston is called Kogo Labs. Learn some new things, meet some people, and then normally when it's time for an accelerator, you're working on your, your company full time. Um, that's definitely oftentimes a major re requirement from accelerators. We want to see that you're working on this full time, you're hiring teammates, and you're kind of at that point of, okay, I think I have something cool. I'm ready to start validating it. And then potentially even re ready to raise money for it. Um, most of the time, companies that are in an accelerator have a working prototype it's often it, you know iterative but it's 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 happening um in just a couple instances i've seen like kind of a design and a napkin get into techstars but um i don't think that's always the case so i think the right time is when you're ready to really commit and start scaling and also like this one last thing i'll add is everyone's going to have a different goal for their experience in an accelerator program. So like if you do choose a program and are selected, like figure out what your real goal is for the, those three months. Is it garnering uh, customer traction, getting ready to fundraise, learning how to manage a team, like have a very specific goal that you want to accomplish. Thank you. Nate, anything you want to add here as we close out related to timing and, and when do you know you're ready? Yeah, I would agree with Marita that 
it is a commitment. So don't do it if you're you still got a day job and you're going to do it kind of half half. Like you've got to really put pour your blood, sweat and tears into it to, to get them. It's sort of one of those things like what you put into is what you get out of it. So you want to make sure that the timing is right for you to commit to it. Um, as far as like this, like where you're at with the company, um, I've noticed that as Techstars has gotten more popular as an accelerator, they've started kind of moving the needle of where they expect the company to be. And like they used to just take back of the napkin companies that just had an idea. And what I've seen over the, over the last few years is they, they've kind of moved to taking companies that are a little bit further along. Maybe they have, you know, some pilot customers or they have a product in the market or they have, you know, they're still early, um, you know, not a, not a mature company yet, but they at least have some, some traction and some signs that there's something there. Um, so that that's something to think about. You know, if if you if you don't have a team or you don't have a product or you don't have any customers, then maybe it's better to wait um, and 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 sort of you know apply for the accelerator when you're ready to be accelerated and um, and not necessarily you know doing it prematurely. Well said. So with that, we are going to work on wrap up here in the chat. I did share a couple of links. So anybody that was looking for um, what it is we were talking about, Mass Robotics Accelerator, Activate was mentioned. We have a resources page on the CRI website where you can filter by accelerators and incubators. I know that it was mentioned a couple of times that we only talked through a couple and there are several. If you filter by accelerators, incubators on our resources page, you'll find a couple more. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna share one more slide with a couple of QR codes for your reference. This here is our CRI website, the first one. One in the middle is our Spark Fund. CRI Spark Fund is currently open. If you are a Northeastern researcher and you are working with Northeastern Intellectual Property, you qualify for the Spark Fund and you're welcome to apply this cycle. Applications close towards the end of November. And then last but not least, we have our Invention Disclosure Form. If you're working on something here at Northeastern and you haven't let us know about it yet, but you want to, to see whether or not we can help support, please do feel free to fill out an Invention Disclosure Form. With that, I wanna provide um, virtual claps here for our panelists today. Thank you so much, Marita and Nate. Your insights are invaluable. We really appreciate the time and talent you offered today. And this is recorded. You will be able to come back and reference it in the future. Thanks to everybody who joined and who stuck with us uh, through our discussion here. This was a fabulous virtual event and we look forward to seeing you next time.